is the 15th Norwich Cafe of the IPPN. IPPN is jointly managed by UNDP, UNFPA, UNICEF, ILO, and the FAO. My name is Matthew Koniak. I am with the ILO office in New York. <sighs> Sorry. Today, we'll be speaking about SDG acceleration through joint programs on social protection and sharing experiences from the joint SDG fund called on integrated social protection and leaving no one behind. We have today three experts who uh, are with us and who will share their experiences. We have Nenad Rava, who is head of programs at the UN Joint SDG Fund in New York. We have Andre Gama, who is a social protection manager at the ILO office in Hanoi, in Vietnam, as well as Eunice Lucia Nerianda, who is a program and policy specialist on social protection and emergency at WFP, uh, joining us from Malawi. So before, before we start and before we give the floor to these great speakers, let's just uh, set the scene very quickly. Joint programs, uh, including those that are financed by the SDG Joint Fund, are a very important vehicle for UN reform. They, they encourage UN country teams to exploit their comparative advantages and complementarities for the sake of the people who need them the most. Today, we will be focused on accelerating the access to social protection. Now, what is true to social protection can, of course, be also true to other portfolios, but due, due to the multi-sectoral nature of social protection, responsibilities uh, are often spread across different line ministries. And so social protection can also be leveraged to generate results across various SDGs. Um, in setting the scene, let us also remember that this exercise is all the more important considering the multiplicity of crisis that we are facing in the world today, from COVID to conflict to climate, and really at the heart of it all, the harsh reality of working poverty and informality, which millions of people are facing. And so in this context, throughout the course of this event today, we'll be referring to the Global Accelerator for Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transitions, which was launched by the Secretary General. The Global Accelerator was presented at a previous session of the IPPN, and you will be able to find the, the link to that previous session in the, in the chat box. It emphasizes the need for integrated policies, and it is therefore hoped that the Global Accelerator will learn and will build on the experience of the first portfolio of the Joint SDG Fund. Now we will get to the speakers. Just before we do so, and we bring this amazing panel our usual notes on housekeeping. Please make sure that your microphones are muted to allow, to allow colleagues to hear the presenters. Do use the chat function to ask questions or to share your experiences and insight throughout the session. And after the presenters, we will open the floor for discussion and you will have an opportunity to, to raise those questions uh, directly. So to get started, I'd like now to ask Nenad Rava from the UN Joint SDG Fund to share his views and give us his presentation. Ned, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the IPPN for providing this opportunity. Um, we closed the portfolio sometime last year and end of last year, but we are still exciting about this because as I will present in the last slide, I think, uh, it really provided foundation for a number of uh, new initiatives that we are um, incubating, including the Global Accelerator. Um, I would like also to thank uh, Maya Marquez for putting this all together and then Andre Yunis for representing not only the portfolio, but two of the uh, most successful joint programs that we had in, in the past couple of years. Um, next slide, please. So um, I suppose that most of you are familiar with the Joint SDG Fund, so I'm not going to go into details and I'm not going to actually go into details on this portfolio necessarily, but I just wanted to provide a bit of a context. Uh, so this uh, call, with them, which then became Portfolio on Integrated Social Protection for Leaving No Behind, was launched just um, at the moment when the uh, broader UN reforms um, uh, were launched. And it uh, basically uh, sprang from the broader intention, which at that time, I think it was maybe even more popular than nowadays, uh, to support integrated policies. Integrated policies, not only in terms of integrated 
and more cohesive um, UN um, uh, country teams, but also on the government side to break down the silos and basically go back to the original maps. Uh, so when we were launching this, we were working closely with the task, task force, I think it was called the task team on integrated uh, policies at that time that uh, was supporting the broader UN SDG structures. And later on, we were lacking housing in a way. So it is great that IPPN is, is uh, relaunching this focus on integrated policy. And, and our emphasis was really, I mean, you can see some of the stuff here in terms of the portfolio. We covered 35 joint programs in 39 countries. Uh, selected progress uh, across 11 SDGs, but all of that was really not only the social protection as a sector, but an integrated social protection that cut across sectors, that cut across institutional boundaries and silos, plus an added integrated aspect, which is uh, what we refer to leaving on behind. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not, I'm not going to present this. This is just to illustrate the complexities with which, with which uh, we were dealing. This is a theory of change for the uh, integrated social protection for LNOB. We were not able to develop this in advance. Um, it was kind of retroactively uh, created when we were doing the midterm review of the portfolio. And it just indicates the complexities, but also how the whole theory of change really tries to go beyond the conventional approaches and, and then uh, you know, land with the SDGs, but also um, uh, support the broader cross-sectoral uh, uh, efforts to, to create multiplier effects and to create this transformative impact across the SDGs and across institutional boundaries. Next slide, please. So these are some of the results. Um, uh, we produced a report, uh, which maybe Maya can uh, provide in the, in the chat. Um, and this report really was uh, quite surprising, not only that we succeeded in almost all joint programs to achieve the, 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 the expected results, in many cases, like in these two countries that we'll present today, even exceeding those, but it, all of that was happening during the pandemic. Uh, so I'm just going to mention one thing, uh, which is, uh, you know, we are quite proud uh, that our country uh, level colleagues uh, managed to do that with their government and other stakeholders is that 147 million benefited directly, either by extended social protection or improved access to social protection. But that's only the tip of the iceberg, uh, which on the next slide, please, um, indicates that uh, we also did that in the way that we approached living on behind with the focus on human rights, disability, and gender, also in, in the integrated manner. So we were putting, it, it's maybe something to discuss uh, during this cafe, is that there's it, there, it's multi-layered. It's not only putting together two or three SDGs or two or three institutions. It checked, it, it's actually putting together integrated, integrated, integrated uh, different approaches. Um, and then on the next slide, next slide, please. Uh, it shows that while we were trying to achieve specific targets on integrated social protection, uh, SDG one point. Uh, uh, Three and uh, three one, and then working on the LNOB, it really kind of had this amazing boom effect, which is you know which we refer to catalytic impact, uh, because we were also working on women and children and older persons and disability. Um, uh, the shock response social protection became very <laughs> popular, unfortunately, during the the pandemic. Ned, we don't hear you anymore, I don't think so, Ness. Uh, no, we can't hear Ned, unfortunately. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, it's good. Go ahead. Okay, sorry, this is the, the headphones. Apologies. So, this, this whole, you know, it was a, actually, I think it, it's a good uh, uh, example of how we might be wanting to do integrated policy in general, because there were relatively small entry points, which you know we refer to as leverage points, and then they just spread, spread in terms of the uh, target vulnerable populations, spread in terms of you know cross sectoral effects, and spread in terms of also aspects of the social protection because we were not only working on the extension of 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 of, of the of the benefits, we were working also on redesign of the programs, we were working also on bringing different new aspects of social protection into the core of the system, and then on the next slide. Um, 
Yeah, so I already mentioned this, we could skip this. Uh, we also managed to repurpose 20% of, of the budget in monitoring programs, and social protection was really convenient platform to do that. Next slide, please. Um, we also try to do similar things like this cafe is. So we had a number of peer learning communities, uh, uh, particularly focusing on innovation, on, on, on new uh, you know, shock responses, social protection models, care services. And we also contributed to this global report uh, on the UN collaboration on social protection, where I think 80% of all the examples came from this portfolio. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what does that mean? Uh, we, we consider these joint programs to be uh, an example of uh, not only integrated policy, uh, but also of catalytic funding. So uh, we hoped, and that really did, did materialize in many cases, that as the joint program ends, it's not only like projectized uh, initiative where everything ends, but that actually there is this uh, follow-up effect, uh, both in terms of continuing to scale the, the solutions, but also in terms of bringing in new funding. So Mongolia is probably one of the best examples where the government continued to provide financing uh, for now regular uh, program. Um, and I think that the total is actually over $300 million uh, uh, over two years. And then there's a number of joint programs where additional funding and financing was coming in or the government continued to scale up. But most importantly, um, this, uh, this whole portfolio provided the foundation for the Global Accelerator. We were not aware of the Global Accelerator when we started. Um, but basically, the whole idea of the Pathfinder countries builds upon uh, the champions from this portfolio, including the two countries here, Malawi and Vietnam, where the Global Accelerator is now trying to actually use some of these experiences, some of these best practices, and bring them further to scale in an in a even more accelerated uh, manner. Uh, but this is not the only thing that, that we kind of incubated in this portfolio. We are working on a number of new thematic windows or SDG transformations, as we call them. So um, there, there is a strong foundation for working on the food systems, on digital transformation, SDG localization. So this is another, um, I think, another um, uh, demonstration of how you can work on, on something that sounds conventional, social protection but then make it genuinely transformative that you don't only integrate social protection across sectors, across vulnerable groups, but you also integrate that with a number of other uh, uh, transitions and transformations like food systems or, or digital transformation. I think this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so very much. Um, and um, I will be here to respond to some of the questions, but I think the focus should be on our uh, two champion countries uh, going forward. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ned, for your excellent presentation. It's really impressive. I mean, 147 million you mentioned uh, uh, who benefited from from these programs and uh, the, uh, the the number of programs, 35, uh, the, the number of countries and really the, the government commitment are all uh, very, very impressive. So, uh, like you said, we are now going to move to these, uh, you know, country level experiences, those countries that actually happen to also be those uh in uh in, wor working in line with the global accelerator so first we will travel east to vietnam uh, where my colleague from the ilo andre gamma is joining us uh andre uh floor is yours if you want to share your experience on the u.s joint program in social protection in vietnam uh thank you very much Mathieu, and good evening uh, everyone from hanoi and, and thank you for the invitation to to present uh the results of our of our United Nations joint program here in Vietnam. Uh, this, is, this was a joint program between the ILO, UNICEF, UNDP, and uh, UNFPA. Um, if, I, if I can move to the next slide, please. Setting the scene very, very quickly, um, the, when we started designing the, the, the UNGP in 2018-19, we were looking at a, a context of increased but still low uh, social protection coverage uh, overall in Vietnam um, with, um, with still a pretty fragmented system. Uh, and I think this, this very quickly is the, the broad setting on, upon which we were designing and, and building the architecture of the UNGP, if you will. Uh, I think we can skip two slides, please. Yeah, next one. Yeah, and so, and, and this of course on building on a, on a, a labor market with a widespread informality, uh, still uh, significant gender levels of gender equality and so on. So a lot of the challenges and, and kind of issues that uh, 
a lot of the countries where the UN GPOs present um, um, uh, were, 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 were being felt. So I, how did we design the, um, the UNGP in Vietnam? Well, first we, we, we put a significant focus on linking social insurance and social assistance, the contributory and non-contributory parts of the system to really build a true multi-tier social protection system. Uh, and of course, aligned with this, we had a vision of contributing to make social protection in Vietnam more inclusive uh, to, to ensure that we leave no one behind. And with these two overarching goals, we tried to build a program that followed a life cycle right braced approach to social protection, um, advocating for more equitable, effective and increased investment in social protection at the same time. So we kept this kind of big picture and broad holistic view of social protection before we start getting into the weeds of what specific interventions uh, and be, from specific agencies could contribute to these ends, but always keeping this kind of big picture angle and vision uh, to 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 our contribution and to the future of social protection in Vietnam. Uh, next slide, please. And so and 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 in here again, uh, we focus a lot on on supporting the integration of social care system and its links with linkages with social assistance. Uh, and we looked at, at issues just such as digitalization of delivery methods and then making shock, social protection more shock responsive or more gender responsive across the, the lines, which are our, our main ideas as, as a UN family when it comes to social protection. Uh, next slide. So in terms of achievements, um, uh, we, we had a, a very successful contribution to, to the development and finalization of decree number 20 from the government, which uh, detailed the expansion of social assistance programs in Vietnam, not only in terms of coverage, uh, but in terms also of, uh, of levels of benefits. Um, we also managed to bring a multi-tier child benefit into the policy orientation document that set up the vision for the ongoing revision of the social insurance law. And even though this is a social insurance law, the idea, the, the idea put forward there is of a multi-tier benefit. Again, a benefit that has a non-contributory and a contributory part, again, to try to bring this vision of a multi-tier social protection system um, into reality. At the same time, we also contributed to the development of an integrated care model uh, including including replacement care for older persons at province level, again, bringing this care component into the more kind of cash transfer programmatic part of social protection and really make sure that these things have a significant level of, of coordination. And at the same time, also contributed to significant efforts to improve the digitalization and the, and the, and the modernization of, of the delivery methods and the data collection methods of social protection. Uh, next slide. So uh, we can skip this one. Uh, these are some of just of the main publications stemming from the, the, the project that we're happy to, to share with you uh, for your further reading if you, if you so feel inclined. But what I wanted to focus the, the rest of my short presentation is really on what we think we learn and we can share with other countries and other colleagues who might looking at de designing or implementing uh, similar processes and what we can share that helped us achieve the, the level of success that we we are very honored that Ned keeps, keeps pointing to in, in all our events. Uh, the first one is stakeholders are key. And I think even though this is a bit of a, an obvious message, it's, it's a bit of a twofold answer, uh, message in the sense that on one hand, it's really important that we continue to leverage existing long lasting relationships that all UN agencies have in our member states and really build on these to, to, to allow us to, to have more activities that are more impactful and have this catalytical kind of impact uh, in, in social protection, but this should not mean that we stay constrained and limited to these partnerships that go 10, 20, 30 years back in time, but also that these, that we are willing to explore new partnerships and look away, look, look beyond our, our standard partners to really uh, in, increase and strengthen our advocacy and your effect, our effectiveness. And so in Vietnam, this means that we continue to work with our standard partner, pa partner on social protection, which is the, which is the minister, Ministry of Labor, Invalids and Social Affairs, MOLISA, but we, and Vietnam Social Security. But at the same time, we explored uh, quite successful new partnerships, in particular with Vietnam Women Union and with the Central Economic Commission of the party, giving us more partners to advocate for the messages that we are putting forward. And also making sure that all stakeholders that are part of the policy making decision process are getting the same messages. And, and this is something I'll, I'll touch uh, a little bit later. Uh, and, I, and so, no, no, uh, still the previous slide, sorry. And so 
and then and so developing a true multi-tier social protection system a system that not only has these tiers but also has increased significant levels of coordination and line between them really requires a coordinated approach and here it's really important that we ensure that all stakeholders are receiving the same message if possible from more than one agency of course uh, we have our specific mandates and areas of focus, but we need, we should agree on key broad messages that frame all our interventions, all our interactions, so that these ideas kind of start permeating into stakeholders' consciousness because they keep being repeated by the ILO, by UNICEF, by UNDP, by UNFPA. So really make sure that at least the broad message of a life cycle approach, a multi-tier system, are always being bred forth in a consistent uh, manner so that we really can, can provide a true joint advocacy and messaging in, in our work. Uh, next slide, please. The third point that I think is really important is we need to be really aware of the policy decision context and the political context in the country. Uh, and this is why having national staff uh, in our offices is of critical importance all across the world. Uh, because the way I see it, in, and if I may be a bit less formal, I like to, to look at our policy advocacy as a sort of tasting menu. We, we bring to, to the government, to social partners, a set of ideas of policy changes that could contribute to their goals, to the strengthening of the system. But then we also need to be flexible enough to understand which ideas have more traction, which ones look more feasible within the political context, within the, the budgetary context of the country, and try to ride the wave on those ideas more, because this is where we really have the, the potential for this catalytical impact that we keep talking about, and this can significantly magnify the impact of our of our interventions of course it doesn't mean that we drop the others but really try to adjust our our, our support to the reality uh, of the country and in those particular moments uh, and then digitalization of social assistance management and delivery is also something that we need to continue to focus because if we really want to connect social assistance and social insurance looking at things as payment methods data collection database integration these things are instruments that can really help countries speed up these processes. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of challenges, again, uh, COVID-19, of course, was, was a significant challenge. And we're really appreciative that the, the SDG Fund allow a significant degree of, uh, of adjustment on our work plans to really meet the needs of our partners during the COVID pandemic. Uh, in, and we did so in Vietnam as well, in terms of social protection response. And of course, when we're trying to move towards a multi-tiered system, it means that the multi-tiered system is not there yet. And we had to face high fragmentation of government of social protection uh, in the country, which I think it's common to many, many countries. And we sometimes we need to accept that we'll still have to work in silos uh, on, under specific circumstances to kind of push the agenda forward in specific issues while we continue to promote stronger coordination uh, and alignment. And so next, next slide, please. So what's, what do we see as the way forward building on, on the UNGP in Vietnam? Well, first, uh, I'll put modesty aside and I'll say more of the same. We do believe that our, in, our UNGP was greatly successful. And so we need to continue on this path. Of course, we need to look for ways to improve, to, to be more efficient, more effective. But it's clear uh, that the, our work was successful is recognized by the SDG fund, by the government, by the social partners in the country. And so we need to build on this. Uh, and at the same time, we need to continue to work on improving stakeholders' capacity, uh, promote better communication and public discourse. Communication awareness raising is something that continues not to be significantly explored and leads to a lot of issues in social protection participation because people don't know, they don't trust, they're not aware. So this needs to continue to be an area of focus. And we would like to have continued uh, interventions because the UNJP finishes, but the policies don't finish. And even if the policies are approved, implementation is when the rubber meets the road. And oftentimes that's where the biggest challenges of all uh, exist. So we, we want to continue our work so we can follow up on these policy changes and policy improvements and, and support their implementation as well, accelerating the application of digital tools and continue to promote uh, greater investment in social protection. And um, one last slide. And so to illustrate the, the success of this joint approach, uh, following the, 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 the later months of the, of the UNJP in Vietnam, we, we were approached by the government to request the ILO to provide to coordinate the UN-wide support to the development of the part, new party resolution on social policies in Vietnam, which is a very high level policy document that is in a way akin to what we can, you can think about as a national social protection strategy. And the government really told us, really, look, we really appreciate it. 
the, this more coordinated, more one UN approach to the provision of technical support that we've been receiving to social protection. And we would like support on this new area, but we want you to continue through this way. And so on this work, we, we've developed a joint report uh, between ILO, UNDP, UNFPA, UNICEF, but also WHO contributed to it and uh, UN Women. So we keep bringing new agencies because we really see that this is the future in terms of the way we work. It's the future that provides better results. And it's clear that our partners in the government really see this as the way forward in terms of our work. And so we're really happy to continue to scale this up. I just had a meeting last week about coordinating more support on, on the social assistance area because we got the new five-year plan from the government and we are again trying to coordinate across agencies and the global accelerator that Mathieu mentioned before and Annette as well. This is again another way that we can build on working together and we are very happy that Vietnam is being considered as a potential pathfinder country and one of the reasons is that we have this experience of working together and we can build on it to continue to deliver more coordinated and, and consistent support to, to our member states. And uh, let me stop there and I hope I didn't go too much uh, over my allocated time, but I'll be happy to answer any questions or clarifications you might have uh, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andre. Very impressive presentation. You didn't go over the allocated time. It was really good and great to hear about the, really the successful, uh, the success of this uh, UN John program uh, in, uh, in, um, in Vietnam. And really also the lessons learned in terms of, you know, the process about how to go by it. You mentioned focusing on the big picture and an expanding partnership beyond the traditional partners. You mentioned, you know, the, the key broad messaging that is the very important, the alignment with the political reality and political context. And, and also, of course, doing more of the same because why stop something that works very well. So it's all very impressive. Um, we are going now to go to our next speaker. Before we do so, let me uh, suggest to everyone uh, who is uh, following us today to think about your questions if you want, because after the next speaker, we will go to a Q&A session. So if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the, uh, in the chat uh, box or in the question box so that we can either read them or offer you the floor and uh, allow you to, to come and raise it directly. But for now, Let's move to Africa. Let's uh, let's go to Malawi, to uh, humanitarian agency WFP, where we are joined by Eunice Lucia Niranda, uh, who is going to share her experience uh, on 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 the same. So Eunice, you have the floor. Hey, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Andre. So uh, thank you, Matthew. I mean. Uh, good, good evening and good afternoon, colleagues, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Eunice Nirenda, and uh, I'm from Humanitarian, so I coordinate social protection and emergencies. I'll, I'll take you through uh, our, our own uh, uh, accelerating inclusive progress towards the SDGs and what happened in Malawi. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I, 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 I'm not going to go much under uh, the background, but what you should just understand is that uh, our two-year program that uh, was implemented uh, from 2020 to 2021 uh, followed uh, the existing uh, Malawi National Social Support Program 2. We, call, we shortened it to MNSSP 2. So this uh, Malawi National Social Support Program is a pillared approach. It has three technical pillars, and our uh, the joint program. What what happened is that we made sure that the components that were under the joint program were aligned to the existing technical pillars, so that uh, we are able uh, to make the progress that the, that that the uh, government of Malawi required. So uh, this program in in Malawi was. Uh, WFP was a convening agency, but uh, in general, it was largely coordinated by the UN uh, Resident Coordinator's Office, and uh, the ILO and, and UNICEF implemented uh, the different components. So the first component was implemented by uh, World Food Program, the second one by UNICEF, and the third one by ILO. But in the end, it was coordinated so that uh, these um, components uh, they are really uh, interlinked 
uh, and, and be able to, to, re to respond to the existing uh, 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 pillars that, that, that we are responding to uh, in Malawi. So the joint program was really uh, there, making sure that whatever was existing, our, are we able to catalyze? Are we able to provide the adaptations that, that are supposed to be, uh, to be made? And are we able to demonstrate uh, that uh, the viable situations at hand so that the government should be able to get the resources that we would want to, to provide from the technical side uh, and, and feed into the existing policies uh, in Malawi? Next slide, please. So the first uh, component was the shock responsive social protection uh, component. So despite the existing policy documents, as I have indicated, the Malawi National Social Support Program, and also the different uh, uh, existing programs, social protection uh, program, Malawi has been faced with a number of challenges. And the main challenge was that even without major shocks like floods, dry spells, and so on and so forth, Malawi experiences uh, year in uh, cyclical food related needs. And these poses challenges to beneficiaries uh, based uh, mainly on the multiple entitlements, especially in times of shocks. So these challenges become uh, uh, increased. Uh, secondly, when we are responding to, to shocks, if they are uh, acute shocks or we have a bigger shock hitting, it is mainly done by humanitarian, uh, the humanitarian systems and they mainly create a parallel system to the existing um, social protection systems. So thirdly, what, what we saw also was that the existing pillars that were developed or designed under the Malawi National Support Program, we couldn't, we needed to fast track them using an uh, evidence, viable evidence that we could demonstrate how we can adapt what was existing and mainly make sure that the humanitarian and social protection sectors are able to speak to each other and we are able to use the existing uh, social protection systems to leverage or respond to a, a humanitarian response. As I have indicated that uh, year in, year out, we have uh, food related needs uh, and, and, and we need to, to, to do a response, which we normally call a lean season response uh, under humanitarian. So that is a development, a, a developmental issue and we needed to look uh, at it from, from both angles. So from the first component, uh, next slide, please. From the first component, we have seen those different uh, achievements. Uh, as you have seen, the, the, the joint program was a, uh, a catalytic uh, intervention that was there to provide basic adaptations to the Malawi social protection systems. But via these different uh, interventions that we have, we have made under component one, we have seen a, a lot of achievements. The first one is that we made sure that we improved uh, coverage of the social protection systems going into an urban cash uh, transfer intervention during COVID. So the problem was at hand and then we, that made us to realize that we had for the first time socioeconomic issues that, that came in due to COVID in urban areas. So we needed to respond. And that made sure that we, uh, through the, the joint program, we are able to design the targeting processes, uh, supporting on registration, set up call centers and, and be able to uh, to use the hotspots uh, verification and mapping through the satellite imaginary. So we made a lot of uh, innovations around what was existing to, to make sure that we improve uh, coverage, comprehensiveness of the social protection system throughout the life cycle. This, uh, secondly, we leveraged uh, the existing social protection systems to respond to a humanitarian uh, uh, response, uh, making sure that we used the existing Unified Beneficial Registry. Uh, the Unified Beneficial Registry is uh, an instrument that provides a single source of information on households eligible for social support services. So we use this, apply the government uh, proxy means test uh, to target uh, those that were 
uh, heavily affected uh, by food insecurity issues. So we leveraged the existing systems to respond to a humanitarian needs. So we, the system was able to expand vertically and horizontally. So out of, out of that, we saw how we could uh, increase coverage of the uh, increase the coverage of the social protection support through the humanitarian needs or that were that were that were there. The other achievement was in the end, uh, apart from the different uh, achievements like the harmonizing the grievance redress mechanism within the social cash transfer program, we also uh, made sure that the components uh, achievements were able to be adapted to a broader operational vision for shock sensitive social protection so that we are able to lay down uh, the strategic objectives for the Malawi National Social Support Program too, and institutionalize the designs that were being uh, developed and implemented and be able to implement the shock sensitive social protection interventions in the country, which we are like at the, at the moment they were unharmonized. And now we are trying to make sure that we harmonize all those different uh, programs uh, uh, long term. Next slide, please. So as you can see under the uh, component number two, which was looking at the financial structure, uh, this component, you can see that uh, the social protection sector is largely funded by donors, uh, including during emergencies, as I have already indicated, uh, which, was, which is currently heavily uh, uh, implemented by the humanitarian sector. With donors funding the flagship social protection uh, program, which is the social cash transfer program, 90% uh, of it, only one government out of one district out of 20, 29 districts is funded by the government of Malawi. So that fragmentation runs across uh, even in the financial arrangements. So what, what, what we need was to address these challenges. The joint program was designed to, to support the enforcement of the uh, financial framework for social protection to ensure that uh, we have adequate resourcing and we are uh, and it, there is an allocation from government and also the government is able to efficiently use these uh, resources uh, in this in the social protection regular programs and also the the during shocks uh, or during the lean season as I have indicated that we respond to each and every year. Next slide, please. So the key achievements under this uh, program, uh, under this component, is that we have seen uh, the social protection financing and expenditures increasing through the reports that, that, that were done uh, the 2021, 2020 and 2021, and then the budgetary briefs that were used as advocacy tools uh, to parliaments uh, during the 2019 to 2020. So we have seen uh, these key tools that were, be, uh, that were made available improved the efficiency and effectiveness of the social protection spending. Uh, in addition, the advocacy briefs that, that were made available uh, were, were used to, for high-level advocacy and provided evidence-based engagements with the, these decision makers at Parliament for improved social protection financing through uh, the government annual budgets. Next slide, please. So the, the last and third component was looking at uh, social policy, social protection policy review. And uh, as, as we have indicated, the, the joint program really looked at, at what were the issues that, that were um, being faced by the Malawi government at the time, and we are trying to adapt and be able to respond to the existing uh, challenges and, and see really, uh, demonstrate how we could be able to respond to the to those existing challenges. So what uh, we did was that uh, with with the COVID uh, nineteen be at hand, we saw that these that these uh, uh, needs or priorities started changing, and we needed to to look at uh, what we had in the JP program, adapted it, and be able to to work through it. 
So instead of doing the legal framework, we made sure that uh, we now went through a review of the national social support policy to develop a new one. And we have done this um, throughout the consultations. And then we, we have now uh, put forward different um, social protection instruments that would now lead to advancements of the social protection uh, legal framework. So these discussions, we, we made sure that the social protection landscape uh, and the policies that were existing are really adaptable to the existing problems and issues that we had, and we are able to, to demonstrate that, that change that we needed to see. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the policy review, we've uh, seen the advancement in, 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 in this uh, social support policy through the consultative uh, process has been done now. It's really in the final stages of approvals. And then we have uh, seen increased social protection coverage. And in terms of designing of new schemes, like the odd, the odd age pension is now under parliament. And from there, we can be able to uh, advance into having an act that will uh, form a basis of the legal framework uh, in, for the social protection in Malawi. So that's quite a huge achievement, not just in one component, but all the components. And, and, and these components are really like responding to what we have existing in the, our own Malawi National Social Support Program too, which is uh, the pillars that are already existing under, under government. So it was like what the needs from government and we were responding uh, to those needs through the joint program. Uh, I think this, that's, that's it. Uh, we can go to the next slide where we are now, where we're asking uh, what are the critical next steps for strengthening social protection uh, in Malawi. Uh, we've, we've been having this discussion, we've worked together as, as, as a group and the, the joint program uh, was well coordinated with the participating UN agencies and the government itself uh, through the uh, national steering committees that were identified to run this uh, Malawi National Social Support Program too. So the joint program was aligned to what was already existing and that uh, had made to sustain achievements that we are following up now with, with even the coming in of the, the global accelerator. Uh, th those existing structures are the ones that we go through it, revamp them, we, we continue taking uh, the progress where we are and how best we can do it and making the design tweaks here and there based on depending on the existing uh, problem uh, at hand. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, over to you, Mashi. Thanks so much, Eunice. Very interesting, very, uh, very, um... Very interesting and also very impressive this presentation on the joint program in Malawi and how really the program has managed to improve coverage to so many people to social protection. But not only that, how you have also managed through the program to improve the financial as well as the legal framework in the country, which is no small feat. So it's very uh, very impressive and great also to to hear towards the end the link with the global accelerator, the same that was that is uh, also with the with Vietnam. So uh, with these great presentations done, we'll now move to the session of Q&A, and we will invite you all to uh, ask questions, to either write them or to take the floor um, and, and, and address them to our uh, three presenters. I don't see any questions in the chat right now, so perhaps just to to break the ice and to to get started I'll, I'll start with some guiding question maybe a question that could be directed to any one of you so you'll decide who wants to go first but um it's uh yeah maybe maybe we could uh, ask in in terms of the change the catalytic change we have heard in your presentations that you know beyond the social protection um, coverage extension more was done so that the joint programs of the the fund of the joint SDG fund could serve as a catalytic change and maybe support 
transformation, to support, support the transformational processes. I'd be curious to hear about your experiences, perhaps from a you know, global perspective, Ned, but also at the, at the country level, how the uh, John program you know, has led to that catalytic, catalytic change. Uh, if you if you would like to to bring that up in a few in a few minutes, I don't know who would like to go first. Maybe, maybe Ned from the global perspective, and then we go to the countries. Thank you very much. Yes, well, we, I think we were quite lucky, uh, and, and our colleagues from the country level were really putting so much effort. As I said, it all it, it all happened during the pandemic. We did design this approach to be properly fully integrated. That's why we, we kept referring to integrated social protection and adding then systems like social protection systems to basically emphasize that we are not looking into one particular sector or subsector. We are not looking into overly narrow approach, but we are looking into the entry points um, but with which you can do transformative change within a relatively short period of time, which is two years, two and a half years for these joint programs. And with relatively small funding, it was up to $2 million plus certain co-funding. So you cannot do conventional social protection approach with that the money in that period and expect major results. So you have to have something different. And this different, I believe, was a high degree of maturity uh, in terms of understanding the systems and where these entry points or leverage points, I mean, too often, I think we are using um, terms from the systems, you know, community, but we are not truly understanding that. Leverage point is really where you make relatively small efforts to turn something around, and then there is the boom effect. So when the, the countries manage to identify those, design joint programs around them, then you can actually have rounds or layers of trying to map and identify the multiplier effect. As it spreads, you know, it's it's weaker and weaker, but it's not only, you know, in one particular focus, it really kind of ripples, has this ripple effect across the system. So this is why I mentioned that while focusing on integrated social protection systems and NNOP, we established foundation for working on food systems, on working on jobs as well, as a part of the global sector, on working on digital transformation and, and, and a host of other issues. So, um, but very important thing to underline, and I'll finish with this, is it has, it has to be contextualized. We cannot have one solution, prescriptive solution at the global level or regional level. Every country is different. And this is not just saying that. It is the reality, uh, starting from the differences in terms of people and different strategies and approaches from the agencies involved, because ILO or WFP is not the same in every single country. To, of course, how these UN country teams are integrated internally in Malawi and, and uh, Vietnam um, have had decades, basically, of trying to work together, which is not always the case in other countries. And then, of course, how government is siloed or not. Uh, so I believe, you know, uh, the system thinking really helps. And then, of course, in-depth understanding of social protection related issues and trying to establish these linkages across the, the different pillars of the SDGs, across different sectors, institutions, and also as Eunice was showing in terms of the triple nexus. Yeah, thank you, Ned, very interesting. I see we have a hand raised, so we're going to come to you in a minute, uh, Abdul Rahman Mohammed. but just before, do Andre or Eunice want to build up on what, what Ned just explained on the catalytic change, perhaps at the country level? Either of you? Um, I, I, I can Go say ahead. a few words, but, but mostly to just to, to kind of stress some of Ned's points. It's, it's easier to do catalytic change with, with less funds when you have been working in the country for decades and you have the teams in place and you can actually very much hit the ground running in a lot of senses. Uh, if you are coming in new in certain countries where we have smaller country teams and you need to develop relationships, develop trust, uh, this would not be possible, I don't think. Uh, so, so that's that's why I think when I mentioned that having having the presence at the country level, sustaining, uh, having national colleagues in all countries uh, there to to help international experts understand the national context and understand where to apply and identify these kind of pressure points that can lead to catalytical change. And it goes back to what I said about 
identifying that we want to push for all these things as the UN when it comes to social protection, but we also need to be realistic that we cannot push everything at a time. And then as, as Eunice was saying, with the Malawi government, like understand what the government needs, what our social partners need, and then try to, to build on those and build on the timing. Because for instance, I'll give you the example of Vietnam. Vietnam is very, very kind of systematized law revision processes. Every law and every large legal document is revised uh, roughly every 10 years. So if we come in and we want to talk social insurance in the middle of this 10 year period, we're not gonna be able to have catalytical change because we are five years away from the process and actually the, 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 the policy, the space for policy reform. So what we did on, on, on the UNJP in particular was okay, the, the decree on social assistance is the one that is currently up for debate, is being discussed. So let's focus on this particular area. So understanding these kind of pressure points and the national context so we can build on those things and build on past work. It's it's really it's really where we see we see the important part. And and to 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 close quickly, uh, what Ned said is really important is that every country is different. And so designing these pros, these projects, uh, the, the UNGPs, the Global Accelerator, in a way that allows for a combination of a systematic approach, but that allows for us to adjust our interventions and our way of working to the reality uh, of and the context of each country is really important. And we are seeing now this with the discussions on, uh, on, the, on the Global Accelerator, where at the same time, we are considering Pathfinder countries uh, where the ILO office might be one or two persons. And we're also considering countries like Vietnam, where our country office is around 100 staff. And even just from a very kind of pragmatic perspective, even that context is completely different on the way we can go about things and the level of resources we, we might need or not. So I think it's, um, it's really understanding the national context and kind of adapt to it so we can push for the things that are more likely to succeed is the only way to really kind of deliver this catalytical approach and throughout bring this one UN approach because we are talking on social protection. I, I called it multi-tier. I think it's called it comprehensive, right? But we're all talking about the same thing, right? Getting things connected, getting everyone working together. And we know that when we work with governments, different departments with different governance, no one wants to, you know, get re lose the, the control over certain programs or certain, certain parts of the, of, of the system. But we cannot tell them to tell them they should do this when if we're not able to actually work together ourselves. Right. You know, if the ILO and UF and WFP cannot work together, why can we tell the social assistance, social insurance department to work together? Right. Yeah. So we need to really lead by example on the way we do things as well to make sure that our message is really is really received and taken and taken seriously. Yeah. No, absolutely right. Working by example, leading by example, and, and understanding the country context, very essential. Eunice, do you want to build on that very quickly, maybe in one minute? Yeah, just, just very quickly. I, 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 I wouldn't let this one pass, especially from uh, being WFP, where there are so many different components that we do that people don't call them social protection. And, and like everyone would, would be looking at us as, as a humanitarian actor, the joint program changed the whole context on how the, the national government looks at WFP and, and, and all the different agencies uh, on, on what value they are adding and what they are bringing to the table and how we can use those uh, uh, UN uh, the agency strength to really like solve the problems that we have at hand. And I think coming in of COVID uh, from our end brought in so many opportunities as well uh, to look at the social support uh, programs uh, that were there in a challenging context, what the opportunities were there, what are the gaps that were existing, and shifted the whole context of, of no longer doing things uh, or running business as usual. So that brought a lot of changes, and we needed to, it to show what innovations really are there and what we can do. And we have seen that through the joint program, we have demonstrated that uh, from the UN together with government, and we move uh, forward uh, as one in all other uh, upcoming initiatives, which, which has been uh, a plus uh, for us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for this addition, uh, Eunice. So let's take questions from the audience. And Abdul, Abdul Rahman Mohammed, your hand is raised. If you have a question, you have the floor. Yes, thank you so much for these great presentations. And I mean, with different country context uh, and different measures. So I have two small questions. 
So the first one, it is uh, about the situation when the country, part of the country, it is in the conflict and the other part of the country, it is enjoying the rele relevant stability. So what would be the best measures in order to do social protection policies uh, in the relatively, I mean, quiet part of the country and also taking into the consideration the other instable part of the country as well. For example, the country context of the Ukraine is the best one. For example, the Western part, it is there is a conflict uh, ongoing there, but the uh, Eastern part, Lviv specifically, uh, uh, enjoying the quiet relatively situation, but at the same time, the system is overburdened by the influx of IDPs there. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, so how do we do that? How do we deal with countries that are at war, but also uh, have other parts of the country that are that that are more stable? Perhaps this, perhaps Eunice would be a good person to start with this uh, question, coming from your humanitarian background. Yeah. Or so other colleagues. I, so who who is in, who who would like to to take that question? Uh, Andre, I, I I can say a few words, but I have no experience in conflict zones, so so bear, bear with me on that. But I think we always look at social protection as having a a shock responsive component that is expected to address emergency situations and a more kind of systematic approach, social insurance and other things that are for more stable times or stable stable periods. I think a war zone like Ukraine is a bit of an extreme case that it's a little bit hard to to speak to specifically. But this is why we talk about shock responsive social protection all the time, because once the crisis started, it's really hard to adjust the system on the go, right? What we need is the system adjusted beforehand. We need to develop shock responsive systems, not only during crisis, but most of all on post and pre-crisis. So then when the crisis happened, we already have the instruments. Otherwise then it, it puts a really big burden on, on policymakers yeah. and institutions to, to deliver on those. And I'll give you just the example of Vietnam when it comes to social protection, because it's really a tale of two systems. You have the more, let's call it standard social protection that has still very little 30, now we are 30 something percent coverage of social insurance, uh, social protection a large in 2016, only one in each four households in Vietnam received any kind of social protection benefit. But uh, over the last five years before the pandemic, the government make a really big effort to expand social health insurance. And by the time the, the pandemic happened, about 90, the social health insurance was up to 92% coverage. So, and the people in Vietnam don't even recognize the, the role that the, the changes may add because once the pandemic hit and they needed, they had the access, they had the affordable access to, to health. So they didn't even notice, you know, that, that this was because the years before the government and the party really put a big effort into in approaching social health insurance from a universal approach with a lot of subsidization from the government. So then when the crisis hit, the system was in place to provide the support. And I think it's really important that we continue to stress all across the world the need for shock responsiveness, social protection systems, so that when we're faced with crisis, the systems are equipped and institutions are equipped with the tools to, to, to deal with them and provide the people who are in need with support in different contexts. Very, very good point, uh, Andre. Thanks so much. Before we close this session, we have time for one more question. I see that uh, okay. Bonolo Matiba has, uh, you have your hand raised, you have the floor. Thank you. I think my question will go to Andre because um, he's been emphasizing on the Catholic approach. Um, oh, I'm Bonolo from UNDP Botswana. And um, my question is, uh, as, as UNDP was done, we tried to align our support to what government wants, and that was mainly um, um, defined in the National Social Protection Framework. But I realized that we are not being seeing any traction while we are supporting the implementation of that framework, which is government framework. We are not seeing any traction um, because... It's, it's more on paper, the implementation of that framework from the government side is, is lacking. 
Um, so I don't know how then do we navigate that space where we are trying to align to a government policy, a government document, but the implementation is lacking. What, what's your advice? Go ahead, Andre. I, I, I think I think it's really you you. It's good that you get in in on the process during the design of the policies because. I think most of the times our greatest issues are with implementation, to be honest. Uh, you, you know, this is really where in a country like Vietnam with 100 million people, where you have 63 provinces with significant degrees of autonomy in the way they implement policies, you, you can make a really beautiful policy document, but then the implementation. And I think the problem with, with the implementation and the follow-up and supporting implementation, it's very, in, uh, it's very costly from a resource perspective. It's much easier to provide a report commenting on a, on a new decree or something like this, where I and my colleague can sit for a few days and kind of provide our technical expertise. When you're looking at implementation on a, on a, on a, at a large scale and looking at those issues, it's really, it's really, it's really, uh, I think, uh, a resource, uh, uh, a resource issue. But getting getting the conversations ahead of time and planning ahead of time, because this is this is something we've been doing in Vietnam. On, on, on several process, legal processes that we are supporting from a technical standpoint, we are already kind of talking, okay, tell me what you see in terms of implementation. Uh, where do you see the gaps? Where do you see the, the scope for support from the ILO and other UN agencies? So that when the, the implementation starts, we, we are at least part of the process. But right. uh, it's, it's difficult because I can tell you the World Bank in Vietnam has, has spent dozens of millions of dollars trying, for instance, to improve uh, data collection and payment systems at the provincial level, with very little results to show for, and uh, they are and they are quite frustrated. So I, I think it's 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 a it's a tricky thing. But I think being part of the process from the beginning and thinking about it not only when implementation starts, but even at the design stage, uh, perhaps can can be a way to to help us be part of of that that level of solution. That's right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Andre. Very sorry we don't have time for more questions. But as it is said in the chat, if you have more burning questions, you can raise them by email at IPPN at sparkblue.org. This has been a really interesting conversation. Thanks so much to Ned from the SDG Joint Fund, to Eunice from WFP in Malawi, to Andre from the ILO in Hanoi, Vietnam. Really clearly, you have shown that joint programs, joint funds on social protection are very essential. Uh, we have been very impressed by your presentations, by the change that the programs, the joint programs have made. And with this, I want thank you again to have joined this uh, coffee chat and I invite you to the next IPPN uh, network, the next uh, conversation. We will be sending you information about this very soon. You can also access the presentation, the recording of today's session and also other relevant resources on the IPPN platform through the link that will be posted in the chat. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks again to everyone to our presenters and to all of you for your questions and have a great rest of your day. Thank okay, you. Bye. Amazing presentation. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.